Thanks very much. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here today on our second lifetime chat. Martin? Scary. Yeah, well, um, you're in the hot seat, mate. Uh, and I'm very excited about this chat because obviously it has a lot of bearing about the work we do. As an Aussie path myself, um, um, I'm really interested in some of the stuff that happens today. So, my name is David Bowen, I'm the therapist manager here at Arthritis Action. Uh, I'm also a registered osteopath and um, I've been really looking forward to the content of this. Uh, Martin, would you like to, um, actually before I go any further, I'd just like to say that I've, we try to design the questions um, that, that we talk through today via the stuff that was sent through from the people watching, from the members and the therapists who prior to this recording yep. um, have sent in. So if we don't actually answer um, all of the questions sent through, we'll do our very best in the time we have to do that. But if we run out of time, then we're gonna endeavor to email um, answers to those questions moving forward. And also this video will be um, on YouTube, hopefully in the next week or so. Yeah, to to we watch. Yeah. So having said all that then, Martin, this is great, it's very exciting. Why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself, about what you do for charity? Okay, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, it is rather nerve wracking, but I hope the audience will find this chat informative as well as interesting. Now, as the services development manager for our fighters action, I am responsible for the development of the self management resource. For those of you that haven't seen that, please go on to our website and check it out. And on top of that, you and I are cold producing mm. um, this lunchtime chat, which is <laughs> within the services development remit. <laughs> now, dietetically, I run clinics um, in, at both Eastbourne and London, and also um, I do offer telephone consultation for our members. Great stuff. Well, I think it's... It's pretty obvious when it works in the, uh, in the charity sector in health that diet is hugely impactful. Um, certainly in clinic, I speak about it to my patients a lot, and your colleague now for a while. Um, and so I'd like to get your thoughts about um, the effects of diet and nutrition on pain and arthritis. Sure. How long have I got? About 30 minutes. Oh. So <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> but, you know, um, we chat about it in the office all the time. Yeah. And, you know, you know that I can talk about this topic until the cows come home, but all joking aside, um, the dietary factors could impact arthritis in two ways, the preventative side and also the intervention. Now the latter do receive quite a lot of attention and also enthralled by people who are living with this condition. And mainly because um, there is so much interest going on. And I think really this chat, um, I really ought to be focusing on to the intervention side of things. Now, before I do so, I just want to set the scene a little bit. You know, arthritis literally means the inflammation of the joints. And often we see like books and newspaper articles, social media, or even you know, the internet, Dr. Google, tend to lump this condition into one entity. Unfortunately, this is not medically correct. In fact, there are different types of arthritis, and it can be broadly separated into two main groups. One of them is called the conditions of musculoskeletal pain, and this include um, osteoarthritis, OA, and by the way, I will refer to um, you know, the, 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 the osteoarthritis as OA or rheumatoid arthritis as RA, just to show at least a little bit. And well, going back to the categories, and the other category is inflammatory arthritis, like your rheumatoid arthritis, RA, your um, psoriatic arthritis, your spondylo um, arthritis, etc. Now, this is um, a bugbear that I would like to share with you. And it appears away from the hospital or the primary care settings, and the lay media often um, you know, use a one size fit all approach in terms of the treatment side of it. Um, so it's a bit like in the Lord of the Rings, you know, one ring to rule them all. 
and, and, he, and, and, and to me, you know, are you telling me that um, you know all types of arthritis can be resolved by food avoidance uh, or even uh, dietary supplements? Um, you know, one of the other things is um, you know it tends to be you know people with RA and OA they all have food intolerances and, and allergies. Now, if I use OA as an example. It is a heterogeneous condition with many different phenotypes and is now being, you know, slowly being, you know, proposed. And um, muscle, uh, muscle weakness is one of them. And then, you know, according to their sort of thinking, they're using that by simply avoiding certain foods, it will help with that. But to be fair, I do understand that there are um, a few overlapping treatments like exercises. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, your arthritis is rather unique to you, and you're learning about you know your conditions, understanding the, um, the, the therapies that are available to you will help with your self management. Sure. Oh gosh, I understand now. I'm <laughs> steering way off about nutrition, so I do apologize. So kind of ring, ring me back. Yeah, sure. So whenever I talk about diet and arthritis. And it's always been you know, both fascinating as well as frustrating. The fascination really comes from you know, learning you know, about you know, how much that we progress in understanding this condition or disease, and also some of the medical treatments um, that are used to help patients. In particular, you know, first off with RA, you know, you start with gold injection yeah. way back, yeah. and then the DMRAPs, and you know, now we've got the uh, anti TNF, the biologics, yeah. and then you know, even now we've got jack inhibitors. Yeah. Which are sort of absolutely you know, exciting. In contrast, myths about diet and arthritis, plenty of them out there, and also no solid diet therapy recommendations frustrates me. Like on that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, as we know, the main component of arthritis is pain. Yeah. And according to a publication, 78% of people living with arthritis are in constant pain most days. And, you know, and coupled with um, certainly with the long term usage of non steroidal anti inflammatory medications, which they have an undesirable health risk. That kind of makes you know dietary treatment you know, somewhat attractive. Yeah. Now, allow me to throw some figures at you. In, in terms of um, within the population of um, people with rheumatoid arthritis, seventy-one percent of them have they believe that nutrition has got something to do with their arthritis, yes. and half or fifty percent and have done or have modified a diet, hoping that they, have, they could reduce the disease activities. So you may ask, is there any sort of validity in terms of whether a diet works within this population? And before I answer this question, I just wanted to point out that the pain or flare-up from arthritis is intermittent. And sometimes, you know, during um, the, the or approaching the end of flare-ups, people tend to, you know, elicit some form of treatment rather than a, a bit like, you know, changing the diet or cut out certain foods, and all of a sudden they become better, and then they kind of, you know, feel that oh, this must be the treatment that that, that helped me to get rid of some of my symptoms, and I think this is a little bit of a misconception. Now that doesn't mean that um, that, that doesn't mean that you know some modifying the diet wouldn't help with the condition. Mm. Take gout for an example. We know that cutting down on meat and animal meat and also avoiding beer helps, mm. but losing weight really is the key. Mm. Now data also found that manipulating the diet may support a very small group of patients with rheumatoid arthritis or RA. But for those who think solely to use diet as a treatment, they are missing the forest um, for the trees. Sure. Because you know, diet is just part of the puzzle. It's part of the jigsaw puzzle piece. And other lifestyle factors like you know, keeping a healthy body weight um, and also um, physical activities or exercises, 
and also smoking cessation can form a really powerful non-pharmacological management for arthritis. So the bottom line really is there's no specific dietary regime to manage arthritis. Some nutrients, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about later, may help, but we don't eat nutrients on, their, on its own. We eat a diet. And it's important um, for me to point out that we need to follow a dietary plan that is not going to cause any sort of nutritional deficiency. A healthy eating really is the foundation. And if you do think certain food that is causing symptoms, keeping a food and symptom diary and discuss it with your rheumatologist, GP, or dietitian would be really useful. That sounds uh, complicated, but also sounds logical as well. And I love the thing about keeping a diary, do the same thing, pay less activity, as you know. I guess one of the things that springs to mind then, and one of the questions we've been asked, is uh, foods like tomatoes. Oh, where does the evidence sit with that? <laughs> well, the famous nightshade vegetables, yeah, yeah. these are, as you mentioned, the, um, the tomatoes and potatoes and peppers, like including the bells, the bell peppers, and aubergines. And mm. you know, if I could receive one British pound, every single time I get asked this question, I probably will have enough money to buy a nice Ferrari. You wouldn't fit in that. You're like a go kart on you. You might be way too big. But well, I don't know actually. You know how I feel about those sorts of cars. Anyway, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. um, it is not as simple as um, you know, some people might have told you. Um, so, Nightshade really get a really bad yeah. uh, reputation mainly because it belongs to this group called Solanasia. Right. And the Solanasia family do have this alkaloid called solomon. And solomon has been purported to be um, extremely pro-inflammatory. Right. Now, apart from sprouting potatoes, um, you know, we, haven't got, we haven't found any trace of evidence regarding this um, solomon in tomatoes. In a uh, 1991 paper uh, published in the journal Rheumatology, um, a few rheumatologists um, suggested rather than this solomon that is the, the, that is the culprit, it's actually the vasoactive amine, which is the um, histamines, mm. that can be a problem in, the, in, the, in, in, in a few susceptible individuals. And I guess that this is why, in, when we look at the uh, overarching data, that only so few people will react um, positively to food within the, um, the, 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 the RA patient group. So it, it's certainly quite interesting. Now, I just want to put a spanner in the works for people that who believe nightshades um, do have a role to play. A fair amount of papers have found that bell peppers are actually anti-inflammatory. Right. Mm, okay. So, uh, I mean, and, and also, one of the medications, or topical medications that we use um, for um, OA, is actually made from chili peppers. Right. Okay. <laughs> that does throw a bit of a spanner in the works, doesn't it? Indeed. So, what about uh, dairy products, milk, for instance? This is another food group that um, tend to get vilified, um, you know, by the um, by the media. I, I do understand that maybe you know cheese that are high in saturated fat, and we all do love our cheeses, mm. and we do tend to eat more of them. And that you know, on that sort of merit, and um, we need to you know, look out for. <laughs> um, but ultimately, you know, we'll be talking about things like milk. Um, you know, interestingly, there's a 2014 study conducted over um, at a group from Boston. I don't know whether it's Boston University, but over in Massachusetts anyway, they examine um, a group of people and whether milk has got any association with their um, with their knee osteoarthritis. Yeah. And it's uh, and in that study, you know, it has a span of four years um, to examine the, the actual effect. The interesting thing was for those of who are drinking 500 milliliters of milk per day or more than that, um, you know, or you know, twice daily, they found that they are actually halt that progression of the knee osteoarthritis right. around about the four years mark. 
And that effect mainly observed, uh, observed in, um, in females rather than in men. And then in terms of what type of milk, the study did not specify. But one thing that um, they conclude that they need to do a little bit more work regarding that because with any sort of uh, nutrition or nutritional studies, there are a lot of confounding factors. So is it because you know, they're drinking milk, they do exercise a little bit more? Mm -hmm. Because that may have quite a powerful effect, as you know. Yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. So about your intolerance milk. We do then um, offer the milk alternatives, such as um, you know, the soya, the almond, um, the, um, the hazelnut milk, as long as um, you will just make sure that they are fortified with calcium. I mean, from what you've said so far, it sounds like a real tightrope to walk in giving the right kind of balanced uh, advice. So that's a bit of a challenge, though. No? Oh, extremely difficult. Yeah, I, I mean, we are all individuals, and certainly we react to food you know, differently. And so, you know, sometimes giving out a blanket statement it, it yeah. is really, really hard. And, and, and really, my recommendation has got to be evidence-based as well. Yeah. So the key really is to listen to your patient to form a good working relationship. And this really formed the foundation of evidence-based practice. And if my patient wanted to modify the diet and they feel that by doing that, um, you know, they're going to um, control the symptoms, I really have got no objection, providing the regime is not producing any sort of nutritional uh, um, deficiencies. Yep. And after all, patients are the expert of the bodies. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of the patient being the expert. Um, I think that's the way forward. Course, so we, we've, talked, we have, we've talked a fair bit so far then about foods there is no, or nutrients there is no evidence for. What do we know works? Ah, okay. Let me start this topic by looking at dietary fat. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that you know, we all heard of um, you know, omega-3 fatty acids. You know, certainly, you know, uh, omega fatty acids from oily fish, and, and you know, in, in headlines, time and time again, has been being you know, either cardioprotective or you know, protect against um, you know, joint pain. And we have actually got ten years worth of data looking at uh, omega fat, omega three fatty acids and RA, and the outcome has been positive. Um, but it is somewhat inconsistent with people with OA. Now, I have pinched this slide, and I do apologize, I, I, I don't know who I actually pinched it from, and this is actually uh, came from uh, last year's EULA conference, and EULA is a European League Against Rheumatism. And I am a, just a little bit disagreed with the fact that the speaker uh, said that high amount of omega-3s um, is going to be helpful for people with um, osteoarthritis because at the moment, at this present moment, um, the data doesn't point out to that direction. But, you know, no doubt, you know, more and more um, evidence will slowly emerging because I know that this is a really active um, piece of research. Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at this slide, and in terms of looking at your know, high fat diet and physical inactivity, which is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later, mm. and in terms of the high fat diet, and something that we know from the literature is high saturated fat diet can be detrimental to the articular conflicts, namely because um, you know, from animal models, we know that they start then degrading some of their um, control sites. Um, and then the human study, similar effects has been seen. Now, if we look at the, uh, the, the National Diet and Nutrition Survey, which is um, you know, a surveillance uh, system um, in the UK, looking at the data, uh, most recent data, in terms of from the 19 to 64-year-old age group, um, their saturated fat intake. Now, um, before I go any further, I just want to explain saturated fat is the fat coming from animals or certain plants like coconut. And the, um, the, the age group of um, 19 to 64, they score 12%, well, their intake on an average is 12%, and the recommended amount is just under 11%. 
and which you know we are you know slowly and you know understanding the message and being able to change you know our dietary in intake. Sure. But one group that I kind of wanted to pay a little bit more attention, really looking at it, certainly you know from the musculoskeletal side, is the over seventy five age group. Mm. Their saturated fat intake is around fourteen point five percent, which is a lot higher. We at this stage we don't know the percentage um, of saturated fat that can be detrimental. Um, a study pointed out to be twenty percent, which is rather high. That means that you need to you know have takeaway almost um, every day in order to uh, meet the amount. But you know, in particular with that age group, they tend to um, you know. They tend not to cook for themselves. They tend to, you know, stack, snack a lot. Sure. So, where we find all the saturated fat, apart from, you know, from, you know, from meat and, and trimmings and so forth, are uh, all the tasty ones like your biscuits, your cakes, and, and so forth. So, yeah, so that would be something that um, just need to, to pay a little bit more attention to. But again, um, you know, when you're looking at that figure, it's you know, from an average point of view, the maybe outlier. So it is that outlier that I'm probably you know, worried a little bit more about. Right. But moving on to um, olive oil, um, we know that um, from different data uh, data sets that olive oil um, have that sort of analgesic um, ability or effect. A Japanese group, I think two years ago, um, looking at the, the usage of um, olive oil um, in terms of um, the disease activity for people with RA, and they have found that if you are if you are combining all, you know, olive oil within the Mediterranean diet setting, yes. it does help to reduce disease activity in, in for people with RA. Right? And then, but you know, saying that, you know, who would you know, drink olive oil on his own is usually, you know, within the Mediterranean diet, which I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Sure. Now, um, the following is probably a little bit more um, you know, interesting because I certainly um, wasn't aware of this um, until recently. High fat diet can actually shift the balance into more pro-inflammatory side of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I probably wouldn't expect that, you know, salt or sodium chloride will have that sort of um, ability to do so, but increasingly more and more data sets are, are pointing out that maybe you know, also ought to look at people's, um, you know, salt intake. Okay. Yeah, and then, and then um, you know, your vitamin and, and, and minerals, they are also quite popular, you know, within the um, rheumatology patient group um, to, to have. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the antioxidants such as the vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, and also selenium. Now, if we take out vitamin D um, just for now, looking at A, C, E, and selenium, on paper it looks absolutely fantastic. But during field tests, we don't see any sort of benefit whatsoever. Right. And talking about vitamin D, um, we know that people with arthritis are usually deficient with this hormone or vitamin. Sure. And by supplementing with it, um, we would hope that it's going to have some sort of you know, um, symptoms and numbing effects. But again, we haven't found anything. Apart from just correcting their, uh, their existing vitamin D level, but we haven't, so far, we haven't really seen that sort of um, you know, uh, symptom modifying effect. Okay. So, talking about uh, uh, nutrient, sulfurethane, which is a sulfur containing compound mm. that's found in broccoli. Mm. Do you like broccoli? I love broccoli. Fantastic. Love broccoli. And, and apparently, um, you know, uh, it, this sulfur containing compound. It helps to protect against any further degradation on our articular cartilage. So it's extremely interesting because I first um, noticed this um, way back, um, a few years back, maybe about five years back, and it's always been an interest of me trying to follow up to see you know, what happened. And the group over at the um, University of East Anglia, they have done sort of like a pilot or proof of principle study. Uh, so it's a small trial, only 40, 40 patients, 
they're really looking at um, you know, giving um, some of the um, pre-surgical pre patients 100 grams of broccoli per day, and then when they are actually being uh, under the knife, and then the synovial fluid has been taken to see how much of that, uh, how much of the um, sulfur-containing compounds in the, in the fluid, and the result has been quite promising. So you know, it is something that I would hope that they are going to do more work on. Okay. Now, I have spoken extensively about some of the nutrients that are, have been shown or found to be beneficial. I mean, like many things in the biological system, they work kind of like in concert to one another. So I certainly believe that nutrients don't act on their own. There must be a, you know, some kind of symbiotic um, behavior with all the nutrients. And then that kind of like leads us to you know, the overall picture, which is the diet pattern or, um, your, or, the, uh, or your, the dietary intake. Sadly, not a lot of data regarding um, dietary pattern and arthritis, mainly because they maybe a lot of confounding factors, and also you know, people tend to drop out. I mean, if there's some sort of um, you know, quite an extreme diet. So all in all, you, you, you know, that side of things that we don't know too much. But um, one thing that we do know is that the vegetarian, the vegetarian or vegan diet tend to be useful. And also, I just want to give a little bit more coverage um, for the Mediterranean diet or the Med diet. Now, back in 2009, there's a Cochrane review mm. looking at um, different diet in terms of um, using that as a therapy for, uh, for RA. Mm. And the conclusion was, um, in terms of um, the uh, Mediterranean diet and the vegan or uh, vegetarian diet, there's some sort of, you know, moderate effect now, because of the methodology used or um, some of the trial design, they're not that perfect, so no firm conclusion um, was made. And similarly, the nice guideline for people with um, RA, it did mention that if patients wanted to try the MET diet, by all means do so, mainly because MET diet is nutritionally complete. It's not one of those you know, wacky diet where you, know, you cut out you know, your certain your food group like your, um, your oranges and your, uh, all the citrus food and you know, hope for the best, so to speak. But there's also another usefulness I mean, you know, for people that think about using their diet. Now, people with inflammatory arthritis, they are, are, they are at a high risk of getting a cardiovascular disease. So we know that by adopting a Mediterranean diet, which has been found in quite a fair few evidence that it is cardioprotective, yes. they can be extremely useful that way. Yes. And finally, we have um, conducted um, the several funded a study looking at uh, using the MED diet and osteoarthritis. Mm. In particular, we are looking at some of the biomarkers for them and also um, your subjective um, indexes. And so far, it has been positive. But again, you know, it is a small trial and, and, and it's also you know, a pilot study. But there's certainly something uh, for the wider research community to look at uh, and really just looking at see whether you know, any further you know, association or further effect that we can conclude about adopting the MET diet for people with arthritis. And finally, one area I think that uh, is going to be extremely important and is closely related to diet is our body weight. Now, if we are carrying more body weight than we should, uh, and we know that that is something that is not ideal, and it is likely going to um, you know, cause problems if we do have arthritis. Now, quite, um, the, I, I always quote this, um, and it often make quite a wow noise within the audience, is one, if you can lose one pound of the body weight, it will lessen four pounds of pressure on your knees every step you walk. And I think this is a study come, came out from Wake Forest University over in the States. And we also know that um, for people that who are carrying more body fat and more body weight than they should, 
um, by combining diet and exercise together, they will see a much better reduction of pain and an improvement in physical function. And, you know, and, and also, when we're, 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 we're talking about you know, um, you know, how much body weight that we need to lose, it seems to be a dose respond relationship where you know, the more body weight that you can lose, the better that, um, that there is a reduction of pain. So at the moment, evidence suggests that a minimum of 10% of um, body weight loss is ideal. But um, the studies conducted um, you know, by Stephen Messier and also um, Professor Hunter, um, they have found that if you can lose your, uh, at least 20% of your body weight, it will further enhance that reduction of pain. And I think this is really important. Um, and, and so far, if we, um, if I have only uh, talked about OA, but in terms of for people with RA, yeah, carrying more body fat is not ideal either because it will make some of your specialist medication less effective, which means that you will have a delay of remission. Sure. So in my clinic, I often refer um, diet and exercise as the golden twins. Sure. I wouldn't you know, talk um, without you know, chatting to um, sure. other of my patients um, regarding the importance of them. I agree. As you know, we've, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the moment mm. hopefully we have time. Um, that's fascinating. I mean, that was a long, long um, piece of information to get to. It emphasizes how long. complex it is and what a balancing act your work is. You have to be very pragmatic. What I really picked up from that is about the sort, especially with people mm. who are maybe at home more, I don't know as much shopping they do, they're probably doing more, you know, um, ready meals, etc. Yeah. with mm. high mm. salt. Um, the thing as I was sitting here listening to you, uh, I was thinking was there's been a lot recently in the press about bacteria, bacterial treatments, gut bacteria. Yeah, friendly bacteria. bacteria. So what about that then? All right, okay. Now our gut has a maximum diversity and density of uh, microorganisms. Right. And some with a rough estimate of around about you know, 100 trillion bacteria. Now, these microbes, they tend to shape the development of the host immune system, as well as determining whether you know, to switch the pro or anti-inflammatory responses on. Now, this field is ever evolving and also um, you know, exciting area that we need to look more into. Um, and the, and they also found that there's a huge range of diseases outside of the gut that are associated with an abnormal or dysfunctional gut bacteria. Interestingly, a coexistence of gut and joint inflammation was found to be prominent in people with spondyloarthritis. Around two-thirds of the patients with SPA, SPA, um, the short for spondyloarthritis, have microscopic signs of inflammation in their uh, well in their gut without any sort of um, you know clinical symptoms. And it, it has long been suggested for people with ankylosing spondylitis, following a low starch diet. Has, uh, has been helpful. Yeah. Now, a study published in 2017 by a group from University, uh, University of Aberdeen has found there's no evidence of that, as well as excluding dairy intake or um, increasing fish uh, oil consumption to dampen down the AS symptoms. In human study, uh, in, well, all the human studies of RA there is a strong association of gut microbiota in the pathophysiology and the progression of, the, of, of this disease. A display of gut dysbiosis has been observed. Now, I do understand that, oh, okay, there's a relationship between an imbalance um, of your friendly or, or, or commercial um, bacteria in our gut. Maybe using a probiotic supplement is going to help. Well, a few, a few studies or papers have been made just to look at that. And at this stage, nothing, nothing conclusive has been found. Hmm. 
of interest, I just um, would like you to um, look at a study um, done by a researcher called Somali and, uh, and his co-colleagues. And he used extensively um, the strain of lactobacillus, uh, well, lactobacillus um, acidophilus and lactobacillus casei and bifidum bacterium bifidum to look at and see whether by ingesting this supplement, well, these sort of probiotic supplements will have any effect on helping with the symptoms against a control group. As you can see there, um, certainly um, you know, there's no difference between the um, intervention and the control group. Again, you know, it can be due to you know, um, the supplement they use or the, method or the methodology. So I guess that this is another area that we've really got to keep our eyes peeled on. Absolutely. I mean, a bit controversial there. So yeah. you know a lot of people, you know, mm. swear by probiotics. Yeah, I do understand. Uh, but the evidence is there to be seen. I mean, remaining on the theme then of being slightly controversial, but there's a question that's come in which um, I wanted to ask from one of the members, which was the birth supplement glucosamine. Oh wow. Again, you know, it is a um, you know, really interesting topic. And we certainly receive pamphlets um, or flyers through our letterbox. Um, or even as an insert in the Sunday papers, uh, you know about you know certain supplements that take this and it will be cure of your arthritis forever. Mm -hmm. And you and I know that it's um, you know it is not going to be the case. Yeah. And you know, and sometimes when people are in constant pain, they will then start looking at uh, any sort of ways to help them. And I think that specialist dietary supplements like glucosamine. Um, you know, often, you know, you know, often in people's first choices because you know they are relatively inexpensive. Yeah. Um, they are also really easy to get access to. Now, again, talking about you know the evidence-based approach in terms of um, answering this question, two studies um, has been set out to answer this, and these sort of studies are not just the randomized controlled trials. They are what we call systemic re review, which means that they are uh, they set a specific question and then they will look at all the available evidence from the research uh, from the field of research, and then they will then uh, make a, a, a firm conclusion from that. Now, in terms of um, looking at the conclusion from um, taking dietary supplements, and all these uh, dietary supplements has been studied. Um, we are talking about the um, glucosamine, we're talking about the, the, um, the turmeric, um, the rose hip. All of them you know, seems to be, well, seems to have a limited evidence to support their use. Sure. And what they mean by that is from a short term basis, which is less than three months, they all have been found to be effective. But you and I know, you know, when people have got arthritis, it's not a short-term thing. Yeah. But when we start looking at data, um, it, extending um, to, let's say, you know, four months or even you know, beyond six months, either there are no data available or the supplements is actually not doing anything at all. Mm. Now, some of the supplements like glucosamine, um, you know, yes, they are easily accessible, and certainly they are not going to be you know, um, harmful, uh, but you will need to take it for such a long time in order for you to see whether it, it actually has any effect. So we're talking about over six months to a year in order to see any sort of effect, if any. So overall, what I'm going to recommend is if we want to try to use some of these specialist supplements, by all means do so, you know, because overall they have been found to be safe. But if you are quite tight on your day-to-day -day budget, don't sacrifice your, um, your, your um, money on food or even your electricity just to buy some of these supplements. Sure. And, and, and also, really be careful of where you get it from as well because with dietary supplements yes. they don't have a tight regulation sure. sure what i would just like to say is that um a lot of the information we talked about today can be also found on a fact sheet which are online on our website which um really does uh, lay out a lot of the stuff that martin's already said i'm very aware of the time so the last few questions come up martin as you know 
Um, I've been developing strength and conditioning programs for people with hip, knee, and spine arthritis. Really excited. So, um, look, I'm working with our partners in wellness. Um, we've developed programs now to help people regain and maintain and develop their function, their independence via gaining the muscle strength back around the joint. So, what I'm really excited about is that some of the conversations we've had leading up to this in that what can we do if someone's going to invest their time in doing those exercises to actually maximize those gains, just like we would with an athlete? Mm. What nutritional advice can you give someone who is slightly older with arthritis in what they should be eating to maximize strength gain? Okay. You and I share the pattern of strength mm, and conditioning. You know, we often have numerous of conversations mm. in the office. Um, people with arthritis may also have sarcopenia. Right. Irvin Rosenberg first coined this term back in 1989, and it is defined as the loss of skeletal muscle, yeah. or skeletal muscle mass, and strength as a result of aging. Recent update of the definition is that there is a component of skeletal muscle loss, a loss of function, and other factors like chronic inflammation. Sarcopenia is accelerated by physical inactivity. And when someone lost muscle mass, they are likely to lose uh, muscular strength as well. And in terms of OA, we ought to look at it as a condition extending beyond the articular cartilage. Because there is, a, there is evidence looking at the sum muscle loss, but it's mainly predominantly that there is muscle or skeletal muscle, tendon, and ligament weakness. And in order to increase muscular strain, we need to make skeletal muscle grow, just like a plant. And in order to um, uh, you know, make the, in order to increase skeletal uh, muscle strength, um, you know, apart from making it grow, in terms of the merit of uh, muscular strength, mm -hmm. and we have also been found that increasing that will help to reduce pain. And again, going back to what we have spoken before, that is probably one element that people want to you know, find a solution to. Now, one way that is really going to be helping um, to increase muscle growth is, the, is to ingest dietary protein because it is a rather important yeah. um, macronutrient. Anabolic resistance is found in, uh, in older people with sarcopenia. And to combat this um, is to increase dietary protein intake. Yeah. The current recommendation, well, the current recommendation for protein intake is around 0.8 grams per kilo per day, which is, which is too low. Mm -hmm. And how can you build a house with a small amount of bricks, mm -hmm. which is not going to happen? So more recent data um, suggested maybe we need to increase it um, to um, around or more um, than 1.2 gram of protein per kilo um, of body weight per day, or separating into um, you know, 0.3 grams per protein per meal four times a day. Some people may say that, ooh, you know, the, the high protein intake is going to be detrimental to, um, to your kidneys. And this is not evidence-based, but you know, caution needs to be taken for people who have existing chronic kidney disease. So when is the best time you know, to ingest protein? Like I said, in a separated dose, um, four times a day. And on top of that, after um, you, uh, um, you have done any sort of resistant training, that will be the best time for people um, to have um, dietary protein. And I would say that protein timing for priming. Amazing. I love that picture, by the way. That's a strong look. I don't think I'll pull that, that tracksuit off. <laughs> you will look good in that tracksuit. No, 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 very blue very, very strong look. Yeah, I don't know if I've got the, uh, the bottle for that. But what I was going to ask you was um, from a purely uh, selfish perspective, mm -hmm. as, a, as an osteopath, I know we've got osteopaths, physiotherapists, and potentially some other allied health professionals watching. Because we're aware of the time kind of running away with us, what would you say um, would be the top tips for someone who works as an allied health professional if they want to give some um, advice to some of their patients and clients? 
certainly within the MSK setting, um, nutrition should be all AHP's business, not only dietitians. Um, the prime time really for you to um, uh, to initiate you know, that sort of conversation is when you are assessing your patient. When you just um, asking them um, about are you, um, you know, eating enough, um, are you you're having you know, a regular you know, protein intake, and one we know from you know, quite a few literature that. Um, breakfast is a really is a, a problematic meal for people that try to you know, increase or bump, uh, bump, bump up their protein intake. So maybe if you know that somebody uh, or your patient is not eating enough protein, suggesting that um, you know, eggs are extremely yeah. useful as yeah. a, a little nutrient powerhouse, or even recommending um, you know uh, sardines on toast uh, that can also be really really good. Um, and on top of that, um, if you come across some really difficult cases, mm -hmm. you know, refer to your friendly dietitian. Yeah. You know, always happy to help. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm really aware of the time, Martin. That's been amazing. Really, thank you very much for having me. Um, it leaves me just to say that any answers that we've been saying, to us to, we will do our very best to um, answer those on email in the in the coming week, uh, hopefully. Um, just to let everyone know that the next lunchtime chat will be with Dr. Wendy Holden, who's a NHS uh, uh, consultant rheumatologist, and she'll be talking about all things to do related to arthritis. So we're looking forward to that one too. That just leaves me to thank you, mate. That's thank you, sir. Thank, thank you for allowing us to take a swim through Lake Martin. <laughs> and uh, I certainly think that, so from my perspective, as a clinician, hopefully also to the members, that's been really, really informative. So thank you very much. Thank you.